Phoenix Rider, Book Three, Chapter Four, The Cribber. It had taken the engineer just a few minutes to take the water dispenser apart. Now he reached inside and carefully disengaged a slim gla- glass file and a file for, from a tangle of wires and circuit board built into the filter. Built into the filter, he said. It's a valve system. Very ingenious. He passed the file to a stern-looking woman who held it up to the light, examining its contents. The file was half thick, half light. The file was half filled with a transparent liquid. She swiggled. She swirled it round, applied it a little to her index finger and sniffed it. Her eyes narrowed. Librium, she announced. She had a clipped matter of, of, a fact, of fact way of speaking. Nasty little drug. I use a spoonful will put you out cold. A couple of drops, though, they'll just confuse you. Basically, knock off your bandons. The restaurant, indeed. The, the restaurant, indeed. The entire Millennium Building it had been closed for a night. The, there were three other men there. John Crawley there was one next to him stood. A uniformed policeman, obviously senior. The third man was a white was a white head and serious, wearing a Wimbledon tie. Alex was sitting to one side, feeling tight, feeling suddenly tired and out of place. Nobody about, apart from Crawley knew that he worked for MI6. As far as they were concerned, he was just a ball boy who had some, somehow stumbled on the truth. Alex was dressed in his own clothes now. He had phoned Crawley, then taken a shower and changed, leaving his ball boy uniform back in his locker. Somehow he knew yet that he had worn it for the last time. He wondered if he would be allowed to keep the shorts, shirt and high-tech trainers with the crossed Racquet's logo embroidered on the tongue. The uniform is the only payment Wimbledon is the only payment Wimbledon ball boys and girls receive. It's pretty clear what was going on. It's um pretty clear that what's going that what was going on. Crawley said, "What Crawley was saying? That? Remember, I was worried about that breaking breaking we had certain this to the man in the club tie." Well. It seems I was right. They didn't want to see anything. They came here to fix up the water dispensers in the restaurant, in the land, and probably all over the building. Remote control? Is that right? Henderson? Is that right, Henderson? Henderson was the man who had taken the water dispenser apart. Another MI6 operative. That's right, sir, he replied. The dispenser functioned perf- perfectly normal, giving out iced water, but when it received a radio signal, and that's what our friend was doing with a fake mobile phone, it injected a few millimetres of this drug, Librium, not enough to show up in a random blood test when anybody happened to be tested, but enough to destroy their game. I think so remember the German player, Blitz, Blitz, leaving the court after he'd lost, he'd lost his match. He had looked dazed and out of focus, but he had been more than that. He had been drugged. It's transpa it's transparent, the woman added, and it had not virtually no taste. In a cup of iced water, it should it wouldn't have been a noticed uh, so normal cut in. But I don't understand. What was the point? I think I can answer that. The policeman said, "As you know, the guard isn't talking, but the tattoo on his arm would indicate that he, or was a member of the big circle. And what exactly would that be?" Sir Norman sputtered. "It's the Triad, sir, a Chinese gang. The Triads, of course, are involved in a range of criminal activities, drugs, vice, illegal immigration, and gambling. I would guess this operation was related to the latter." Like any other sporting event, with more than a drug's millions of pounds worth of bets 
Now, as I understand it, the young Frenchman Lefebvre Lef- began the tournament with with odds of three hundred to again to one against. He's actually winning, but then he beat Blitz and Bri- 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 Byron Bryant. What he said? Exactly. I'm sure Lefebvre it had no idea personally what was going on. But if all his opponents were drunk before they went into court, well, it happened twice. He could have gone up right up to the final. Big Circle would have made a killing. A hundred thousand pounds bet on the freshman would have brought them thirty million. Sir Norman stood up. The important thing now is that nobody finds out about this, he said. It would be a national scan- scandal and disgraceous for our reputation. In fact, we probably have to begin the whole tournament again. He glanced at Alex, but spoke to Rory. Can this boy be trusted not to talk? He asked. I won't tell anyone what happened, Alex said. A good, a good, good. The policeman nodded. You did a very good job, he added, spotting this chap in the first place. And then following him and all the rest of it. Although I have to say, I was, it was, you know, I think it was rather irresponsible to lock him in the deep freeze. He tried to kill me, Alex said. Even so, he could have frozen to death as it, as it is. He may as well lopped, lost, lost a couple of fingers from frostbite. Hope that would spell his tennis playing. Well, I don't know, the policeman coughed. <coughs> he was clear, clearly to una- clearly unable to make Quali- to make Alex out. Anyway, well done. But the next time, do try to think what you're doing. Sh- I sure don't want. I sure you. I'm sure you won't any. Wouldn't any. I'm sure you wouldn't want anybody to get hurt. To hell with the lotto, then. Alex stood up. Alex stood watching the waves. Black and, and black, black and silver in the moonlight, as they rolled into the silver of in the moonlight, as they beat rolled into the sweeping curve of Fistral Beach. He was trying to, but the put for the policeman, so Norman had the whole of Wimbledon out of his mind. He had more or less saved the entire of all England tennis tournament, and although he hadn't been expecting a season ticket in the Royal Box and a uh, tea with the Dutch. Duchess or Kent, nor had he thought he, he would be bundled or quite so hastily. He had watched the finals on his own on TV. At least they kept him in his ball boy uniform. Unless, at least, they'd let him keep his ball boy uniform. There's one other good thing that he had to come out of it all. Sabina hadn't forgotten her invitation. He was suddenly on the ver. ver- Veranda of the house her parents had rented, a house that would have been would have been ugly anyway else in anywhere else in the world, but would seem perfectly suited to its position on the edge of a cliff. Are you looking the Cornish coast? It was an old-fashioned square, part brick, part white painted wood. It had five bedrooms, three staircases, and too many doors. Its guard was more than dead alive, dead alive, blasted by salt and salt and sea spray. The house was called Brook Sleep, although nobody knew who Brook was, why he had thought, why he had le- leaped, or even if he had survived. Alex had been there for three days. He had been invited to stay the week, but there was a movement behind him. A door had opened and. Sabina Pleasure, Sabina Pleasure, stepped out wrapped in a thick toweling robe, carrying two glasses. It was warm outside, although it had it had been raining when Alex arrived. It nearly always seemed to be raining in Cornwall. The weather had cleared, and this was suddenly a summer's night. Sabina had left him outside while she went to, in to have a bath. Her hair was still wet. The robe fell loosely down to her bare feet. Alex thought she looked much older than fifteen years. Oh, thanks, thanks. The, ra- the ra- veranda was wide with a low balcony, a swing chair, and a table. Sabina set the glasses down and sat down herself. Alex joined her. 
the wooden frame on the swing to creak and they swung together, looking at, at the youths. But for a long time, neither of them said anything. And suddenly, why don't you tell me the truth? Sabina asked. What do you mean? I was just thinking about Will Wimbledon. Why did you leave straight after the quarterfinals? You were there one minute, court number one. And then, I told you, Alex Captain, being uncomfortable, I wasn't well. That's not what I heard. There was a rumour that you were involved in some sort of fight. And that's another thing. I've noticed you and your swimming shorts. I've never seen anyone with so, with so many cuts and bruises. I'm buddy at school. I don't think so. I've got a friend who goes to Brooklyn. She says you're never there. You keep disappearing. You were away twice last term, and the day you got back, half the school burned down. I leaned forward and picked up his coat, rolling the glass with, rolling the cold glass between his hands. An airplane was crossing the sky, tiny in the great darkness. His eyes blinking on and off. All right, Sab, he said. I'm not really a schoolboy. I'm a spy. Teenage James Bond. I have to take time off from school to save the world. I've done it twice so far. First time was here in Cornwall. The second time was in France. What else do you want to know? Sabina smiled. All right, Alex. Ask a stupid question. She drew her legs, snuggling into the warmth of the towering rope. But there is something different about you. You're like no boy I met. Kids! Sabina's mother was calling out from the kitchen. Shouldn't you be thinking about bed? It was ten o'clock. The two of them would be the two of them would be getting up at five to catch the surf. Five minutes, Sabina called back. I'm counting. Sabina sighed. Mothers. But I had never known his mother. Twenty minutes later, getting into bed, he thought about Sabina Pleasure and her parents. Her father, father, a slightly bookish man with a, with long grey hair and spectacles. Her mother, round and cheerful, like more like Sabina herself. That, there were only three of them. Maybe that was what made them so close. They lived in West London and rented this house for four weeks every summer. But he turned off the light and lay back in the darkness. His room set high up in the window or in the roof of the house. He had, he had one the house had only one small window and he could see the moon. But glowing white is perfectly round as one or as one penny piece. From the moment he had arrived, they treated it him. They all treated him as if they'd known him all his life. Every family had its own routine. And Alex had had, had been surprised how quickly he had fallen in with theirs, joining them on long walk along the cliffs, helping with the shopping and the cooking, or simply, simply sharing the science, reading and watching the sea. Why couldn't he have found it like this? Alex felt an old familiar sadness in creep up on him. His parents had died before he was even a few weeks old. The uncle who had brought him up ha and who had taught him so much had still been, in many ways, a stranger to him. He had no brothers or sisters. Sometimes he felt as isolated as in a plane that he had seen from the ver veranda making its long journey across the night sky, unnoticed and alone. And it pulled the pillows up around and around his head. Annoyed with himself, he had friends, he enjoyed his life, he managed to catch up with his work at his school, and he's having a great holiday, and with Bill Lock with the Wimbledon business was behind him, MI6 would leave him alone, so why was he letting himself slip into the mood? Some, the door opened. Somebody had come into his room. It was Sabina. She was leaning over him. He felt her hair fall over again fall against her, his cheeks and smelled her faint perfume, flowers and white musk. Her lips brushed gently against his. You're much cuter than James Bond, she said, and then she was gone. The door closed behind her. 5.15 the next morning. If this had been a school day, Alex wouldn't have woken up for another two hours, and even then he would have dragged himself out of bed, unwilling. But... This morning, he had been awake 
In an instant, he felt the energy and tension coursing through him. And walking down to Fistel Beach with the dawn light, pink dawn light, pi- light pink in the sky, he could feel it still. The sea was calling to him, daring him to come in. Look at the way, look at the waves," Sabina said. "They're big," I muttered. "They're huge. This is amazing." It was true. Alex had been surfing twice before, once in Nor- Norfolk. Once with his uncle in California, but he had never seen anything like this. There was no wind. The lo- local radiation se- station had warned a deep water squalls and an expectation high tide, expectionally high tide. Together, these had produced waves that took his breath away. They were at least ten feet high, rolling slowly inland, <coughs> as if they carried the weight of the whole ocean on their shoulders. They crashed. They broke. They crashed as they broke. Was a huge. Was as they broke. Was huge. Was terrifying. Alex could feel his heart pounding. He looked at the moving walls of water. The dark blue. The vibrant white. Was he really going to ride one of these monsters on the flimsy board, made of nothing more than a strip of fiberglass? Sabina had seen him hesitate. What do you What do you think? She asked. I don't. Kn- I don't know. Alex replied, and realized he was shouting to make himself heard. Heard over the roar uh, of these waves. The the sea's too strong. The Sabina was a good surfer with the net with the morning before. Alex had watched her ski. Has skillfully manoeuvring some nasty reef bri- breaks close to the shore, but now she looked uncertain. Maybe we should go back to bed, she yelled. And was took in the whole scene. There were another half dozen. There were another half dozen surfers on the beach, and in the far distance, a man setting a jet ski in the shallow water. He knew that he and Sabina would be the youngest people there. Like her, he was wearing a three millimeter. Neoprene wetsuit and boots which would protect him from the cold. So why was he shivering? Alex didn't have his own board, but he wanted an o- ocean magic thruster. Sabina's was wider, thicker board. Wider, thicker board. Wider and thicker board. Going for stability rather than speed. But Alex preferred the, the thruster for its grip and the feeling of, the, of control provided by its, its three fins. He was glad also that he had chosen an eight foot four, four an eight foot four. If he was going to catch wa- waves as big as these, he was going to need egg and need the extra length. If Alex wasn't sure he was going into the water, the waves looked as about as twice as tall as him, twice as tall as him, and he knew that if he made mistakes, he could all eat too e- he could all too easily get killed. Sabina's parents had forbidden her to go in if the sea looked too rough, and he had to admit it never it had never looked rougher. He was another wave coming, come, crashing down, and I have turned back if he haven't heard one surf according to another, the words ripping across the empty sands. The cribber It couldn't be true. The cribber had come to Fistel Fistel Beach. I had heard the name many times. The cribber had become a legend. Not just in Cornwall, but throughout the surfing world. Its first record visit had been in September 1966, more than 20 feet high, the most powerful wave ever to hit the English coast. Since then, there since then there had been occasional sightings, but few had seen it. A few still had managed to take the ride. The cribber, the cribber. The other surface was surfers were calling its name. Whooping and shouting, he watched them dance across the sand, their boards over their heads. Suddenly, he knew that he had to go in the water. He, he that he had to go into the water, but he was too young. The waves were too big. You, but he would never forgive himself if he missed his chance. I'm going! He shouted and ran forward, carrying his board in front of him, the tail connected to his ankle by a tough U.A. U.S.A. leash. Out at the corner of his eye, he saw Sabina raise her hand in a gesture of good luck. 
But then he had to reach the edge of the sea and he felt the cold water grip his ankles and threw the board down and fl- dived on top of it, the momentum carrying him forward. Then then he was lying flat on his stomach. He let his legs stretched out behind him, his hands paddling furiously over the top of the board. This was the most exhausting part of the journey. Alex concentrated on his arms and shoulders, keeping the rest of his body still. It had been, it had, he, he had a long way to go. He needed to go on slow energy. He had... He heard a sound above the pounding of the sea and noticed the jet ski pulling away from the shore. That puzzled him. PWSS, PWCS, personal watercraft, were rare in Cornwall and he certainly hadn't seen this one before. Normally they were used to tow surfers out to the bigger waves, but this jet ski was striking out on its own. He could see the rider hooded in the black wetsuit. Was he or she planning to ride the quibble on a machine? He forgot about it. His arms were t- getting tired now, and he hadn't even made it halfway. He cupped his hands and scooped the water as he felt himself shoot, f- shoot forward. P- the other servers were well ahead of him. He could see that point where the waves crested. About 20 metres away, a mountain of water rose up in front of him, and he ducked in- and he duck dived through it. For a moment, he was blind. He tasted salt and chill, and the chill of the water hammered into his skull, but then... He is out on, on out the other side. He fixed his eyes on the horizon and redoubled his efforts. The foster carried him forward as if it had somehow been filled with a life of its own. I stopped and drew breath. Suddenly everything seemed very really silent. He was lying on his stomach, rising and falling as he swept over the waves. He looked back at the shoreline and was surprised to see how far he had come. Sabina was watching him, was sitting and watching him, a tiny speck in the distance. The nearest surfer was about 30 metres away, too far to help if anything went wrong. The knock-off, there was a knot of fear in his stomach, and he wondered if he hadn't been a bit hasty coming out here on his own, but it was too late now. He sensed it before he saw it. It was as if the world had chosen that moment to come to an end, and all nature was taking one final breath. He turned and there it was. The cribber was coming. It was hurtling towards him. Now it was too late to change his mind. For a few seconds, Alex stared in astonishment at the, ro- at the rolling, curving, thundering water. It was like watching a 44-storey building wrench itself out of the ground and hurl itself onto the street. It was built entirely out of the water, but the water was alive. Alex could feel its incredible strength. Suddenly, and awesomely, it rose up in front of him and went on rising until it blotted out of the, out the sky. Techniques that that he had learned a long time ago took all over automatically. Alex grabbed the, the back of the back, grabbed the edge of the board and turned round so that he was for, uh, once again facing the shore. He forced himself to wait until the last second, moved too late, and he would miss everything. But too early, and he, he would simply be crushed. His muscles tensed, his teeth were shattering, his bo- whole body seemed to have become electri- electrified. Now, this was the most difficult part. The movement that was hardest to learn, but impossible to forget. The pop-up. Alex could feel the board travelling with the pulse of the biggest wave in the world. His speed and the speed of the water had become one. He brought his hands down, sat on the board, arched back and he pushed. At the same time, he brought his right leg forward, goofy-footed. When he was snowboarding, he was exactly the same. But he didn't care, as long as he could actually stand up without losing his balance... And already he was doing just that, balancing the two main forces, speed and, gravi- and gravity. And the thrust, the silence, diag- diagon- diagonally, diagonally across the wave. He stood straight, his arms out, his teeth bared, perfect centred on the board. He had done it. He was riding the cribber. Sheer excitation coursed through him. He could feel the power of the wave. He was part of it was plugged into the world and already and although he must be travelling at sixty seventy kilometers per hour, time seemed to have slowed down almost to a halt, and he was frozen in this one perfectly mo- perf- perfect moment that it would be with him for the rest of his life. He yelled out he yelled out loud an animal cry that he, he couldn't even hear. Spray rushed into his face, exploding around him, he could barely feel the thrust under his feet. He was flying. He had never been more alive. Then he heard it over the roar of the waves. He was coming up fast to one side of him. The whine of a petrol engine to hit anything. Anything mechanical here at this time was so unlikely. That 
he thought he must have imagined it. Don't you remember the jet ski? It must have gone out of the sea and then circled around behind the waves. Now it was coming in fast. His first thought was that the rider was dropping in. The rider was dropping in. It was one of the unwritten laws of surfing. Alex was up and riding. This was his wave. The rider had no right to cut into his space. But at the same time, he knew that was crazy. Fistral Beach Beach was practically deserted. There was no need to fight for space. And anyway, a jet, jet ski coming after a surfer. It was unheard of. The engine was loud now, and I could see the jet ski. His entire concentration was fixed on the quiver, on keeping his balance, and he didn't dare turn around. He was suddenly aware of the rushing water, thousands of gallons of it, thundering on his, under his feet. If he fell, he would die, ripped apart before he could drown. What was the jet ski doing? Why was it coming so close? And she knew he was in, he was in danger quite suddenly, with total certainty. But what was happening? Had what was what was happening had nothing to do with Cornwall and his surfing holiday. Holiday, his other life, his life with MI six had caught up on him. Had caught up with him. He remembered being chased down the mountainside at Point Blo, and knew that the same thing was happening again. Who or why did that didn't matter. He had just seconds to do something before the jet ski ran him down. He flicked his head and saw it for just a second. Black nose, like a torpedo. Torpedo. Gleaming, chroming glass. The man squatted low over the controls. His eyes fixed on Onyx. The eyes were filled with hatred. They were less than a metre away. There was only one thing Onyx could do, and he did it instantly. Without thinking, the air release moved. The demand split second timing and total confidence. Onyx twisted round and, pro- and projected himself off the top of the wave and out into the air. At the same time, he crashed down and seized hold of the thruster. One hundred each side. Now he really was flying, suspended in midair as the wave rolled away beneath him. He saw the jet ski race past, covering the area where he had been only seconds before. He spun around, drawing almost a complete circle in the air. At the last moment, he remembered to place his foot right in the centre of the board. This would take all his weight when he landed. The water rushed up to meet him, and it finished his circle, plunged once again into the set rays of the wave. It was a perfect lander. landing. Water exploded around him, but he reminded, but he remained upright. And now he was just behind the jet ski. The rider turned back and I saw the look of, an, of astonishment on his face. The man was Chinese. Impossibly. Incredible. He was incredibly. He was holding a gun. Alex saw it come up. Water dripping off the barrel. This time there was nowhere he could go. He didn't have. He didn't have. The strength to try another aerial burst out. He threw himself off the board and forward onto the jet ski. He felt a jolt. His legs almost being pulled off his board. I don't know, it suddenly moved all over in the water. There was an explosion. The man had fired, but the bullet missed. I thought he felt it pass over his shoulder. At the same night, same time, he, his hands grabbed the man's throat. His knees crashed into the dust side of the jet ski. The entire, entire world was whipped away, away as a man and machine lost control and tumbled into a spinning vortex of water. Alex's leg jerked a second time and he felt his leash snap. He had a shout. Suddenly the man wasn't there anymore. Alex was on his own. He couldn't breathe. What had pounded down on him. He found himself being sucked helplessly into it. He couldn't struggle. His arms and legs were useless. He had no strength left. He opened his mouth to a scream and the water rushed in. Then his shoulder hit something hard. He knew he had reached the bottom of the sea and that, that, that this would have to be his grave. He had dared to play with the cribber and the cribber had taken his revenge somewhere far below. Another wave broke over him but Alex didn't see it. He lay where he was, finally at peace. Chapter 5. Two weeks in the sun. Alice wasn't sure what was more surprising, to be still alive or to be, to find himself back in London, headquarters of the Special Operations Division of MI6. The fact that he, w- the fact that he was still breathing down, he knew he, w- he was still bre- breathing was, he knew, entirely down to Sabina. Sabina. She had been sitting on the beach watching in awe as he rode the quiver towards her. He had seen the jet ski coming up behind him even before he did, and he and had known instinctively, instinctively that something was wrong. He had she had started running the moment moment. Alex had leaped into the air and was already in the water by the time he crashed down next to the jet ski and then disappeared below the surface. 
Later on, she would say that there had been a collision, a terrible accident from the ocean. It was impossible to see what had really taken place. Sabrina was a strong swimmer, and luck was on her side. Although the water was murky and the waves still huge, she knew where Alex were, where Alex had gone down, and she, and she was there in less than a minute. She found him on a third, on a th- on her third di- dive, dragged hit, dragged his unconscious body to the surface, and then pulled his, him ashore. She had learned to ma- learn mouth to mouth, resus. Skitation at school, and she used that knowledge now, pressing her lips against his, forcing the air into his lungs. Even then, she was sure that Alex was dead. He wasn't breathing. His eyes were closed. Sabina pounded on his chest at a sudden spasm and a fit of coughing as Alex came. As Alex came to, but then some sort some of the other servers had arrived. One of them had a mobile phone and called for an ambulance. There was no sign of the man on the jet ski. Alex had been lucky too. As it turned out, he had ridden Cribber just far enough to be the end of its journey. When the wave had be, had had been at its weeks kissed, a ton of water had fallen in onto him but five seconds earlier and it might have been ten tons also. He hadn't been too far from the shore when, where, when Sabina found him. Any further out and she might never have found him at all. Five days passed since then. It was Monday morning, the start, start of a new week. Alex was sitting in in room 1605 on the 16th floor of the anon, anonymous building in Liverpool Street. He had sworn that he would never return here. The man and the woman with him in the room were the last two people he wanted to see. And yet, he was here. He had been drawn in as easily as a fish in a net. As usual, Alan, Alan Blunt didn't seem so, seem particularly pleased to see him. Preferring to study the file on his desk in front of him rather than the rather than the boy himself, it was the fifth or sixth time Alex had met the man in overall command of this section of my my six, and he knew almost nothing about him. Blunt was about fifty, a man in a suit in an office. There were no photographs on the desk, nothing to personalize him anyway, anywhere. Was he married? Did he have children? Did he spend his weekends walking in the park or fishing out or watching football matches? Somehow Alex doubted it. He wondered if Blunt had had any existence at all. Outside these four walls, he was a man defined by his wealth. His whole life was devoted to, to secrets, and in his own and in the end, his, own, his whole life had become a secret itself. He looked up from the from the neatly printed report. Crawley had no right to involve you in this business, he said. Alex said nothing. For once he wasn't sure he that he agreed. The Wimbledon ta- Tennis ta- Champions Championships. You nearly got yourself killed. He glanced quizzically at Alex. And this is my business in Cornwall. I don't like my agents getting involved in dangerous sports. I'm not one of your agents, Alex said. There's enough danger in the job without adding it to it, Blunt went on, ignoring him. What happened to the man on jet ski, he asked. We're, interroga- We're interrogating him. How? Mr. Simpson replied. The deputy head of special operations was wearing a grey trouser suit with a black leather handbag that matched her, eye- matched her eyes. There was a silver brooch on her lap, like lap lapel, shaped like a miniature dagger. It seemed to appro- appropriate. She had been the first to visit Alex as he'd recovered in the hospital in New Quay, and she at least had been so concerned about what had happened. Of course, she had shown a little or no emotion, if anyone had asked. She would have said that that she didn't want to lose someone who had been useful to her. Might be useful, yeah, but I suspected that this was only half the story. He was a mo- she was a woman, and he was 14 years old. If Miss Jones had, this, had a son... He could be. He could well be the same age as Alex. That me- that made what that made a difference. Once that she wasn't able to, quite able to ignore. We found we found a tattoo on the man's arm. She continued. It seems that he was also a member of the Big Circle gang. She turned to Alex. The Big Circle is a relatively new triad. She explained. It's also unfortunately one of the most violent. 
I think I'd noticed. Alex said, The man knocked you out and refrigerated at Wimbledon with a sailor. That means a little brother. You have to understand how these people work. You smashed their operation and made them lose face made them lose face. That's the last thing they can afford they can af- they can afford. So they sent someone after you. He hasn't said anything yet, but I believe he's a Dalo or a big brother. He'll have a rank of four hundred and thirty. That's one that's one under the dragon head. The leader of the triad. Hmm. The leader of the triad. And now he failed too. It's a little unfortunate, Alex. As Alex that is as that's that as well as half drowning him. You also broke his nose. The triad will take that as another humiliation. I didn't do anything, Alex said. It was true. It, he remembered how the thruster had finally been torn away from his, his ankle. It wasn't his fault that he had that it had hit the man in the face. That's not how they'll see it, Miss Jones went on. She sounded like a school teacher. What we're dealing with here is you and she. I just waited for her for her to explain. Grand Chi is what gives Big Circle its plow power, she said. It's a system of mu- mutual misrespect. It ties all the members together. It essentially means that if one of one of them, one, if one of them means that you hurt them all, that if if you hurt one of them, you hurt them all. And if if and if one of them becomes your enemy, they all do. You attack one people at Wimbledon, Blunt. You attacked one. You attacked one of their people at Wimbledon, Blunt Vosp. They sent another down to Cornwall. You take out the man in Cornwall. You take out the man in Cornwall. The order goes out to the other members of the tribe to kill you, Miss Jones said. How many members? How many other members are there? Alex asked. About um nineteen thousand at the last count. Blunt repli- replied. There was a long silence, punctured only by the distant traffic, sixteen floors below. Every minute you stay, every minute you stay in the country, you're in danger, Miss Jones said. And there's not a great deal we can do. Of course, we have some, some influence with the triads. But if we let the right people know that you're protected by us, it may be possible to call them off. But that's going to take time. And the fact of the matter is, they're probably working on the next plan of attack right now. You can't go home, Ben said. You can't go back to school. You can't go anywhere on your own. That the wo- that woman who looks after you, the housekeeper. We've already arranged her to be sent out, to be sent out of London. We can't take 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 any chances. So what am I going to do? Alice asked. Mister glanced at Blunt, who nodded. Neither of them looked particularly concerned, and he suddenly realised that things had worked out as exactly as they wanted. Somehow, without knowing, he had he played it in the played right into their hands. By coincidence, Alex, Miss Jones began. A few days ago, we had a request for your service. It came from an intelligent service, the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA, as you probably know them. I need a young person for, for an operation. They happen to be mounting, and, and one they wondered if you might be available. Alex was surprised, and my six had used him twice, and both times they had stressed that nobody was to know. Now it seemed but they had been boasting about their teenage spy. Worse than that, they were even prepared to lend him out, like a library book. As if reading his mind, Miss Jones raised her hand. We had told him, of course, that you had no wish. Till continuing the sign of work, she said. That was off that was after all. What you had told us, a schoolboy, not a spy, that's what you had said. But it does seem like that everything has changed. I'm sorry, Alex, now now. But for whatever reason, you've chosen to go back into the field, and unfortunately, you're in danger. You have to disappear. This might be the best way. You want me to? You want me to go into a, to go to America? Alex asked. Not exactly America. Blunt cut in. You want you to go to Cuba, or at least to an island just a few miles south of Cuba. It's called K O S Q L E T O. That's Spanish. It means skeleton key. Alex said. That's right, of course, you are on plenty of keys off the coast of America. 
who would have heard of Key Largo and Key West. This one has was discovered, uh, so discovered by Sir Francis Drake. The story goes that goes that <coughs> when he landed there, the place was un un uninhabited, but he found a single skeleton, a con a conquest stand stador in Falamba sitting on the beach. That was how the island got its name. Anyway, no matter it's called, it's actually a very beautiful place. A tourist resort. Luxury lux, luxury luxury hotels for diving, sailing. We're not asking you to do anything dangerous, Alex. Quite the contr- contrary. Contrary. You could think of this as a paid holiday. Two weeks in the sun. Go on, Alex. Go on. Alex said. He couldn't help sounding doubtful. The CIA is interested in a KOS man escalate because of a man who lives there. He's a Russian. He has a huge house, some some might even call it a palace in uh, on a sort of isthmus isthmus that is to say a narrow strip of land and at that at that very so northern tip of the island. His name is General Alex Alexei Sarov. Blunt pulled a photo out of the file and turned around so that Alex could see it. Could see. It showed a fit looking man in a military uniform. The picture had been taken in Red Square, Moscow. Alex could see the onion shaped tower on, of the Kremlin behind him. Sarah belongs to a different age, Miss Jones said, taking over. He was a commander in the Russian, Russian army. At a time when the Russians were Russian were our enemies, I'm still part of the Soviet Union. This was this wasn't very long ago, Alex. The collapse of the con- commission. It was only in 1989 that the Berlin Wall came down. She she sobbed. I suppose none of this means very much to you. We did it. We did it at school, Alex said, in history class. Yes, of course, but you have to understand. Sarah was a hero of hero of the old Russian Russia. He was made a general when he was only thirty eight, the same year that his country invaded Af Af and Hanistan. He fought there for ten years, rising to be second in command of the Red Army. He had a son who was killed there. Sarah didn't even go to his funeral. It would have meant it it would it would have meant abandoning his men, and he wouldn't do that not even forward one day. And look looks at the photograph again. You can see the hardness in the man's eyes. It was a face with a shred of warmth. The war in Afghan Sitan ended when the Soviets withdrew in nineteen eighty nine, Mr Jones continued. At the same time the whole country was falling apart. Communism came to an end and Sarov left. He made no secret of the fact that he didn't like the new Russia with its jeans and night trainers and McDonald's at every street corner. He left the army, although he still calls himself general and went went to live in Sel- and went to live in Stalin- in Skeleton Key. Alex finished the sentence. Yeah, yes, he's been there for over ten years now. This is the point, Alex. In two weeks' time, the Russian president is planning to meet him. There, there was nothing surprising in that. The two men are old friends. They grew up in the same part of Moscow. But the CIA are worried. They want to know what Sarah is up to. Why are the two men meeting? Old Russia and New Russia. What's going on? The CAI want to sp- spy, spy on Sarov. Yes, it's a simple surveillance, surveillance operation. They want to send in an undercover to the team to take a, to take a look around before the president arrives. Fine, Alex shrugged. But why do they need me? Because Galogen Key is a com- communist island, Blunt explained. It belongs to Cuba, one of the monisms that still exist. Getting in and out of this of the place is extremely difficult. There's an airport at at Santiago. Santiago. Very plain is watched. 
Every passenger was checked. They were always on the lookout for American spies. And anyone who was even slightly suspect, su- suspected is stopped and turned away. And that is why the CIA, CIA had come, have come to us. Miss Jones continued. A single man might, suspic- might, m- m- might be suspicious. A man and a woman might be a team. But a man and a woman travelling with a child? That has to be a family. That's, that's all I want from you, Alex. Blunt said, You go in with them, you stay at their hotel, you swim, you smoke, and enjoy the sun. They do all the work, and you're only there as part of their cover. Can they use an American boy, Alex asked? Blunt coughed, obviously embarrassed. The Americans would never use one of their own young people in an exercise like this, he said. They are a different set of rules to us. I mean, they got worried about about him getting about him killed. We wouldn't have asked you, Alex. We wouldn't have asked you, Alex. Miss Jones broke the awkward, awkward silence. But you have to leave London. In fact, you have to leave England. We're not trying to get you killed. We're trying to protect you, and it's the best way. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt is white. K O S Q L. Eleto is a beautiful island, and you're really very, and you're really very lucky to be going there. You can look on the whole thing as a free holiday. Alex thought it over. He looked from Alan Blunt to Miss Jones, but of course they were giving nothing away. How many agents had sat in this room with the two of them listening to them be their honey-eyed, honey-eyed words? It's a simple do- job. Nothing to do it. You'll be back in two weeks. His own, un- his own uncle had been wondering. Something to check on the security in the computer factory on the south coast. But I had never made it back. Alex wanted none of it. And Alex wanted, had wanted none of it. There were still a few weeks of, of the summer holiday left. And he wanted to see Sabina again. The two of them had talked about northern farms in the Loire Valley. Youth hotels and hiking. He had friends in he had friends in London. He had friends in London. Jack Sarbright, his housekeeper and closest friend, I offered to take him with with her when she had invited her parents to Chicago. Seven weeks of normality. Was it too much to ask? And yet he remembered what had happened at the cribber with him when the man on the jet ski had caught up with him. Alex had seen his eyes for just a few seconds, but there had been no mistaken the, the, the mistaken their cruelty and fanaticism. There was a man who had been prepared to chase him across the top of a twenty foot twenty foot tall wave in order to move him down from behind, and he had to and he had come perilously close to succeeding. I knew with a sick certainty that he try that the tried would try again. He had to offend. He had offended them, not once more, but twice. Blunt was right about that. Any hope of an ordinary summer had gone out the window. If I help your friends in the sea, you can get me the tri- You can get the tribe to leave me alone. He asked. Miss Jones nodded. We have contact in the Chinese underworld, but it will take time, Alex. Whatever happens, you're going to have to go into hiding. At least for the next couple of weeks. So why not do it in the sun? I explained it warily. He said, he's all right, he said. It seems I don't really have a lot of choice. When do you want me to leave? Blunt took an envelope out of the file. I have your, I have you an air ticket here, he said. There's a flight this afternoon. Of course they would have known he would accept, they known he would accept. We will want to keep in touch with you while you're, we want to keep in touch with you while you're away, Miss Jones muttered. I'll send you a postcard, Alex said. No, that's what I, not what I had, had in mind. Why don't you come and have a word with Smithers? Smithers had, a, of, had an office on the 11th floor of the building. At the, and, at the, and at first, Alex had to admit that he was disappointed. It was Smithers who had designed the various gadgets Alex had used on his... Precious missions, and Alex had been expected to find him somewhere in the basement, surrounded by cars and motorbikes, high-tech weapons, and men and women in white coats. But this room was was boring, large, square, and anonymous. 
It would have belonged to the chief executive if almost anything, an insurance company, perhaps, a, or a bank. There was a steel and a glass desk, a telephone, a computer, in and out trays, and an Angelia, Angelia Boyce cat lamp. A leather sofa stood. A leather sofa stood against one wall, and on the other, on the other side of the room was a silver filing cabinet with six drawers, a picture hung on the wall behind the desk. A view of the sea, but disappointingly, there were no gadgets anywhere. Not so much as an electric pencil sharpener. Smithers himself was behind the desk, tapping at the computers with with fingers almost too big for the keys. It was one of the fattest people Alex had ever met. Today he was wearing a black three-piece suit, that which, with that what looked like an old school tie, perched limping on the great world of his stomach. Seeing Alex, he stopped typing and 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 swiveled round in a leather chair that must have reinforced to hit reinforced his to take his weight. My dear boy, he exclaimed, how delightful to see you. Come in, come in. How have you been keeping I hear you have you had a bit of trouble that business in France. You must really look after yourself, Alex. I'd be I'd be mortified if anything happened to you. Stall Alex was surprised when the door sh- swung shut behind him. Voice activated, Smith explained. Do please sit down. Alex sat on the second layer chair on the other side of the desk. As he did so, there was a low hum, and the angly p- boy's lamp swiveled round and bent towards him like some sort of metallic bird, taking a closer look. So at the same time, the computer screen flickered, and a human skeleton appeared. Alex moved a hand. The skeleton's hand moved with a shudder. Then he realised he was looking at, or rather through himself. You're looking well, Smith said. Good bone structure. What? Alex began. It's just something I've been work. I've been working on. A simple X-ray device, useful if anyone is wear is wearing one. Smith pressed the button. Uh, pressed the button. And the screen went blank. Now, Mr. Blunt tells me, Mr. Blunt tells me that you're off to join your friends in the CIA. At CIA. They're fine operators, very, very good, except, of course, you can never trust them and they have no sense of humour. KSQL of toe. I understand. He leaned forward and pressed another button. On the desk, Alex glanced at the painting on the wall. The waves had began to move. At the same time, the image shifted, pulling back, and he and he revealed, 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 that he was looking at the plasma television screen with a picture beam by a satellite from somewhere above the Atlantic Ocean. Alex found himself looking down on an irregularly shaped island surrounded by turquoise water. The image was time-coded and he realised that it, w- it was being broadcasted in the t- room live. Tropical climate, Smith muttered. There'll be a lot of rainfall at this time of year. I've been, de- I've been de- 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 developing a poncho that doubles as a parachute. But I don't think you'll need that. And I've got a marvellous mosquito coil. As a matter of fact, mosquitoes are about the only thing it won't knock out. But you won't need that either. In fact, I'm told the only thing you actually do need is something to help you keep in touch. A secret transmitter, Alex said. Why does it have to be secret? Spinner's pulled out, opened a drawer and took out an object. Which he placed in front of Alex. Alex. He was on my mobile phone. I've already got one, thanks. Alex muttered. Not like this one. Smith retorted. It's solar powered. It will recharge itself even when it isn't plugged in. It works underwater and in space. The pads are fingerprint sensitive, so only you can use it. This is a model. This is model five. We all, we also had had have a model seven. You hold it upside down when you dial, or it blows up in your hand. Why can't I have that model? 
Alex asked. Mr. Bone has forbidden it. Smithers leaned, for, le- leaned forward con- conspiratorially. But I have put in a little extra for you. You see the audio port, port just here? Dial 999, it'll shoot out like a needle. Drugged, of course. It'll knock out anyone, anyone in a 20 metre range. And it's picked up the phone. Have you got anything else? I was told you weren't to have any weapons. Smith sighed, then leaned forward and spoke into a potted plant. Could you bring them up, please, Miss Pickering? Pickering? Ax was beginning to have serious doubts about this office, and these were confirmed a moment later when the leather sofa suddenly split in half. The two ends moving away from each other. At the same time, part of the floor slid aside to allow another piece of sofa to shoot slightly into place, turning the two-seater into a three-seater. A, a young woman had been carried up with a new piece. She was signaling with her legs crossed and her hands on her knee. He stood up and walked over to Smithers. The other item, items you requested, she said, handing over the package. She produced a sheet of paper and, and placed it in front of him. And this report just came in from Carrier. Thank you, Miss Pickering. Smithers waited until the woman had left using the door this time, then glanced quickly at the report. Not good news, he muttered. Not good news at all. Oh, well, he said the report into the out tray. There was a flash of electrics, electricity and the paper self-destructed. A second later, there were only ashes left. I'm bending the rules to doing this, he went on. But there are a couple of things I've been developing for you and I don't see why you shouldn't take them with you. Better safe than sorry. He turned the package upside down and the bright pink packet of bubblegum stayed out. The fun of working with you, Alex, Smith said, is adapting the things you'd expect to find in the pockets of a boy your age. And I'm expe- extremely pleased with this one. Bubblegum. It blows rather special bubbles. Chew it for 30 seconds and the chemicals in your saliva re- react with the compound, making it expand. And as it expands, it will shatter just about anything. Anything. Put it in a gun, for example, and they'll crack it open. Or, lock, or the lock on the door. I turn the pa- packet over. Written in yellow let- letters on the side was the word bubble. Bubble 0 to 7. What flavour did he make it? He asked. Strawberry. Not this other device is not even more dangerous, and I'm sure you won't need it. Smith shook the package, and a keeling sid slid out to annoy the bubble gun on the desk. It had a p- bright green plastic figure attached to some sort of creature. Alex leaped forward, uh, forward and turned it over. He found himself looking at a model of a Tyrannos- Tyrann- Tyrannosaurus Rex. Smithers beamed. I think you'll agree. I think you'll agree. This is quite stunning," he said. "Well, if you like plastic, well, if you like plastic and the dinosaurs, no, no, Alex, you don't understand. That's that's what it is—a stun grenade. All you have to do is twist the head round twice, clockwise, and once anti-clockwise, and you'll arm the device, and then." And then drop it and run. And there will be a 10 second delay and then one hell of a bang. Not powerful enough to kill. But in a confined space, it will impact, in, impacitate the opposition for a couple of minutes, which might give you a chance to get away. Alex po- pocketed the dinosaur figure and the bubble gum along with the mobile phone. He stood up feeling more confident. This might be simply. Simple surveillance operation, paid holiday, as Blunt had put it, but he still didn't want to go go empty-handed. Good luck, Alex, Swindler said. I hope you get on all right with the CIA. They don't really, they don't, they're, they're, they're not really like us, you know? And heaven knows what they're made of, make, make of, what they make of you. I'll see you, I'll see you, Smithers. I've got a private lift if you're going downstairs. As Smith smoked, the six door, spoke, the sp- six drawers of the filing cabinet did six, slid open. Three going one way, three going the other, to reveal a brightly lit cubicle behind. Alex shook his head. 
Thanks, Mr. Smithers, he said. I'll take the stairs. Whatever you say, old boy. Just look after yourself, and whatever you do, don't swallow the gum. Why, right, everybody, that's the end of me reading you for today's Alex Wilder book story. Bye bye, everybody, and thank you for reading this second episode of Alex Wilder and Book 3. So, bye bye, and thank you, this, thank you for listening to this.